Would you open your Bibles, please, to Luke chapter 15? Luke chapter 15. Before we partake of the Lord's Supper this morning, I'd like us to all try to own and internalize this truth that Jesus came to save you as an individual. Jesus came to save me as an individual. It's so tempting for me to see myself simply as a very small and insignificant part of the massive group of people that Jesus came to save. But it's a challenge to accept that Jesus came to die for me individually. Luke 15, listen to what Jesus says, beginning in verse 3. So he told them this parable, saying, What man among you, if he has a hundred sheep and has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open pasture and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance. I love this parable because it's so personal. Jesus does not describe an entire flock of sheep that went missing. There's only one. And Jesus doesn't say that he hires a bunch of people, a group of people to be a search party so that as a group they can go out and search for this sheep together. No, he goes it alone. It's one shepherd looking for one sheep. In order to better appreciate this parable, it's important to remember why Jesus told it. It was a response to a very, very wicked attitude on the part of the Pharisees. Look in verses 1 and 2. All the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to Jesus to listen to him. And both the Pharisees and the scribes began to grumble, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. The Pharisees were disgusted that Jesus spent time with wicked sinners. If Jesus was supposed to be this great teacher of the law, then surely he would have stayed as far away as possible from sinners. The Pharisees had a totally different mindset than the mindset in this parable. In the parable, Jesus says that the angels in heaven would rejoice when one sinner repents, but the Pharisees would think that the angels in heaven would rejoice when one sinner was judged and destroyed. The very name Pharisee comes from the Hebrew term separated one. And they believed they were to remain completely separate from anything and anyone who might be spiritually unclean. So instead of interacting with sinners to bring them to repentance, they believed they should pass by on the other side of the street, leaving those sinners to their own well-deserved destruction. And since Jesus was not separating himself from these sinners, they assumed that he was condoning their lifestyle and that he was a sinner just like they were because of it. But Jesus was not condoning their lifestyle. He was trying to save them from their lifestyle. The only way to do that was for him to interact with them so that he could teach them the truth about God's word. Now, I think the Pharisees would agree with the physical part of Jesus' parable here that if there's a shepherd who loses a sheep, Well, he would go looking for it, but they would disagree with his spiritual application. They wouldn't see sinners as sheep because sheep are just kind of dumb animals and they, you know, they wander off and that's just, they're just animals. But these wicked sinners Jesus is hanging around are human beings who chose by their own free will to disobey God. And therefore they, they should get the punishment that they deserve. They made their bed and now they have to lay in it is their attitude. But with that attitude, they're missing the point of the parable completely. This parable has nothing to do with whether or not the sheep deserved to be saved. It has everything to do with how valuable that sheep is to the shepherd. Jesus would agree with the Pharisees that these are wicked sinners deserving of punishment 
for what they have done. But he would strongly disagree with their conclusion that they should just be left alone to burn for all eternity. Jesus says, may it never be. I, they have tremendous value to me. I am their shepherd. They are my sheep. I'm not going to just leave them be lost forever. I'm going to go find them. I'm going to go search for them regardless of the reason that they're lost. In fact, he doesn't just tell one parable. He tells three in response to their attitude. And in every parable, there's a different reason why what was lost was lost. In this first parable about the sheep, the sheep was lost due to ignorance. Sheep are just dumb animals. They don't think through their decisions like they should. But look at the next parable in verse 8 through 10. He says, Or what woman, if she has ten silver coins and loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin which I had lost. And in the same way, I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. So in this parable, the coin was lost because of someone else. Through no fault of its own, it was lost, yet it was still worth finding because it still had tremendous value to its owner. Now, I do not want us to press this too far. I'm not saying there are people who are lost and it's just not their fault at all. We're human beings with free will. We're not coins. <laughs> We're not inanimate objects. But there are people who are lost not just because of dumb or ignorant decisions, but maybe because they've been damaged by other people. They've been sinned against by other people or misled by others. So maybe it's not 100% their fault. But then as we continue, we see another parable, and we'll just read a few verses here, 11 through 13. And he said, a man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate that falls to me. So he divided his wealth between them. And not many days later, the younger son gathered everything together and went on a journey into a distant country. And there he squandered his estate with loose living. So in this parable, the son was not lost due to ignorance, and he was not lost because of someone else who influenced him or led him down the wrong path. Here he was lost due to utter selfish rebellion. Yet in the end, when the son returns home, he finds that his father was still waiting for him. And when his father sees him coming back from a long way off, he runs, which was just undignified for a patriarch in that time to do. He takes off running towards his son and embraces him. But you see, the Pharisees we're like the older brother in this parable. In verse 28, the older brother became angry and was not willing to go in. His father came out and began pleading with him. You see, the older brother did not want the father to welcome his son back. He wanted this son, his, his brother, to be punished for what he did, not welcomed home and given a place of honor. See, to the Pharisees, it didn't matter why a person was a sinner. It didn't matter what a person's individual story was, how they got to where they were. That person deserved punishment from God, and they should receive it without mercy. That's not how Jesus looked at people at all. He saw every person as a precious soul with so much value. He would leave heaven, go have personal one-on-one -on -one conversations with people and then die for them on a cross. And did you notice the thread that runs through all three of these parables? They are all personal and individual. There is nothing in these parables about saving an entire group of people. It's one shepherd looking for one sheep, one woman looking for one coin, one father looking for one son. You are the one, and I am the one. Now, it may be, it may be that we have a pharisaical attitude toward people who are lost in the world. If so, we need to repent and start to see people the way Jesus does. One of the major flaws of the Pharisees is that they viewed everyone else as a sinner, but did not see themselves as sinners, too. It's ironic because... <laughs> If God really treated people the way Pharisees thought that he should, if God were to just destroy sinners without mercy, 
God would have to destroy them too. Yet instead, because of God's desire to save and to bring sinners to repentance, Jesus came to die on a cross to save the Pharisees too, if only they would recognize their need for that mercy and salvation. In my experience, however, many Christians take the harsh view towards sinners that the Pharisees do, but in reverse. Instead of the Pharisaical view that everyone should be obliterated but me, many Christians think everyone should be saved but me. It's easy to accept that Jesus died to save other people, but not me. Why would he save me? What, what possible value could, could I have? I mean, we can see why he saved other people because, boy, look at all the, the talents and all the contributions that they can make to, to his kingdom. Or we can see how they saved this other person because they didn't live nearly as sinful a life as I did before I became a Christian. And plus, that, that person, they, they don't stumble and struggle to serve God the way I do. So, so why would he save me? I'm going to ask a profound question. And I have to give credit to a preacher named Doy Moyer for challenging me with this. It'll help you to see if you struggle to accept that Jesus died for you as an individual. Here's the question. Imagine that of the billions of people on the earth, you were the only one who needed salvation. Would Jesus still have come to die on a cross just for you? I must confess to you, when I first heard this question, I, I struggled, and maybe still struggle, to answer it in the affirmative. It was uncomfortable to think about, and, and I immediately wrote it off as, well, well, that's just hypothetical. You know, we all need salvation, and it's ridiculous to think that, you know, I'm, I'm the only one that, that needs saving. It, it's so much more comfortable lumping myself in with the whole group of sinners that Jesus came to save. I thought of all the collective language in the New Testament about salvation, right? John 3, 16, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Or Romans 5 and verse 8, God demonstrates his own love toward us, right? And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It's tempting to get the impression from the collective language in these verses that the only reason Jesus came to die on a cross was because he could save us on a group discount. Like maybe he got us on a buy one, get billions free deal. But if that deal wasn't going on, he would not have come down to, to shed his blood for a buy one, just get that, that one deal. And certainly he would not have come down just to buy me with his blood, would he? That's exactly what Jesus is teaching in these three parables of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. I realize even the sheep parable is hypothetical in terms of application because Jesus talks about 99 righteous people who need no salvation, right? Even that is a hypothetical scenario because... There is none righteous. We all need salvation. And I admit the question I pose is hypothetical too because, again, we're not the only ones who need salvation. But let's not miss the point Jesus is making in these parables that every single person as an individual has tremendous value to God. So yes, even if hypothetically, out of 99 people, you were the only one who needed saving, Jesus would still come and die for you. And yes, I would venture to say, even hypothetically, out of billions of people, if you were the only one who needed saving, Jesus would still come find you because you are God's child. It's certainly true that Jesus died for everyone. But our identity, our value, our worth in Christ must never simply be tied to the group but realizing that we each have individual value to God so much so that Jesus came to find you and me. In another passage, describing himself as a shepherd, 
Jesus said this in John 10 in verse 3, To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. The New Testament mainly uses collective language to talk about salvation because the New Testament wasn't just written to one person, but a group of people that all needed salvation. But never forget, Jesus knows your name. You are his sheep. You are God's child. God the Father sent Jesus' his Son to come save you. Let's think about that as we partake this morning.